Uh, as you can see, I have three names, so you know I'm from New England. <coughs> uh, there's my contact information. It'll be at the end of the slide as well. And this, this is a, a culvert rehab project that was just constructed. We just finished last week. We, we were able, it's at Kraut Crawford uh, Notch in New Hampshire, which is a, a tourist attraction. You can see it's a very, rather narrow notch with a railroad and the highway next to it. We, uh, <coughs> we, you know, we, we're generally running uh, eight, nine hundred dollars a linear foot on some of these liner technologies for the, for the larger pipes. This one it had rock scaling in it, uh, and we're, we're at about $1,500 a linear foot. This is the Clint Eastwood vintage Crawford Notch, uh, you know, where the beginning of the Saco River uh, formed here, and you know, it, before the railroad came in, there was actually an elevator where oxen would get onto the elevator and they would be lifted up 50 feet or so and, and, and continue on. Uh, <clears throat> tourism is a big, big part of some of our projects. It's, it's, a, it's a large deal when roads wash out and, and tourists can't go, go to where they need to be. Second largest industry, I think that was, that was, that's been true not only in modern times, but that's probably one of the primary reasons why the railroad uh, was able to go in, was passenger, uh, passengers to Mount Washington. We've zoomed out from the notch here and you can see uh, a water body on the left side of New Hampshire Route 302. That's called the Saco Lake. It's the, it's the headwaters of the, the Saco River that runs all the way down into the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, so we, <coughs> You know, this is, if you're ever in New Hampshire, this is Crawford Notch. It's a small little depot. It's near Mount Washington. Interesting place to, to go. So when it comes to rock scaling, we, we did lose the old man on the mountain back around 2003. I think people are still grieving. This, this, was, this was a attack coated emulsion that was developed by our materials and research lab. It's about a six foot high uh, painting that they've, you know, put good use to uh, white and yellow traffic paint and green bridge paint and some extra lab materials. So that's what that's what you that's what you see as a an engineer's version of Rembrandt. <coughs> you know, this is actually uh, right around the same area where we've done the rock scaling. This is shows you know how narrow it really is here uh, this ledge on the left is where all the scaling took place we have uh, we've put in these teco uh, you know high high tensile steel wire uh, permanent permanently bolted into the ledge face and uh, for for any loose rocks that will be uh, so we had Mark Wahlberg out here. I, I, I think he's, I think he's, uh, you know, been building some building some burger joints here in Cleveland, and uh, but he was real proud of his crowbar work. I, I had some some videos, and if you're interested at all, I have some videos of the actual rock breaking away and and hitting the um, Teco fence down below. Our, our contractor initially thought he was going to put some Jersey barriers up with a chain link fence. Uh, that wasn't. That's uh, and this this also is in New Hampshire a number of years back, but this is why uh, my understanding is they simply uh, got those wires out of the way and just rolled that thing off the road and kept going. <laughs> anyway, the but but if you have any questions about the rock scaling, uh, we we did use drones, uh, targets, and flew over through the pass, and and that was a study in itself. The watersheds, I call them the bat wing watersheds. They're, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna <coughs> see if I can, 
figure out this laser pointer. Yeah. There we go. <clears throat> so we, this is off of one mountain, narrow uh, Mount Field, and this is called Elephant Elephant Head. You can recognize it because it, when you're driving along, it looks like a, a big elephant head and a trunk uh, down on the. But basically equal size watersheds. The <clears throat> I think we've tried to work in harmony with the beavers out here because they've set up shop on the south side or south uh, west side, and all the man-made activity seems to be down along the road on that side. But the confluence uh, occurs right at the inlet to our, our culvert, which is uh, in, in New Hampshire technically a bridge. Uh, normally we start with regression as our preferred method of, uh, and, and it, we looked at stream stats, we looked at the Federal Highway method, and this, this study by Dr. Jennifer Jacobs, or as the technical lead, in this steep slope uh, regression uh, seemed like it would be something that would be useful here, but all of our regression methods were, were up around 700, 800 CFS for 100 year at this location. And we moved on to deterministic hydrology with the curve number method and of course, this is abutting up to a federal uh, national federal park. So here again, the batwing watersheds. All the gray area is non non grouped hydrologic soils. <clears throat> so it leads a lot to for judgment. And uh, as as you you all know, the curve number method, the the curve itself has a lot of the the error, perhaps behind initial abstraction. Uh, we, we, we applied uh, an existing uh, analysis with rainfall runoff in HydroCAD with, uh, with pond nodes, these blue ones with storage, and some of our catch basins, and smaller culverts without the storage, the hex hexagon or the uh, six-sided uh, uh, subcatchment areas as well as the reach reach depiction for hydrologic uh, you know synthetic hydrograph routing and ultimately we settled on an approach that <clears throat> just used one pond here uh, with, with rating curves developed out of HY8 uh, looking back at what we what we started with here uh, I, I'm a I'm a boundary surveyor as well, and and uh, sometimes you you, you want to follow in the footsteps, but you're left with something like a deed description such as uh, well a thousand feet along the river and then and back into the woods as far as the Indians will let you have. Can you survey my property? This this is kind of similar with the archives that we have in New Hampshire, as far as <clears throat> how this design was arrived at back in the 50s. We, after so many years, a lot of this stuff goes in the trash. So we weren't able to figure out how the design was arrived at initially, except for what, from what's out there. You can see they've matched the terrain here. This worked for about a year and it failed. So, so they, uh, so I think uh, resilience, you know, is what, they learned that a couple of years later uh, with this. This is the inlet structure, and this is the, uh, I have some photos of this railroad culvert, but basically this is a concrete pad and an improved inlet, and the other components include a, an upsized uh, metal arch for the, the upper section. That upper section is about a half a percent, the middle section is about 4% and the lower section is about 10%. This thing, this, this bridge or culvert is roughly 925 feet long. We only have about three of them that I know in, in New Hampshire of that length. But this was the, this is a work of art. You know, it's, a, 
reducer box, uh, all nice trowel job inside, and then we developed an energy dissipator, or they did back in the 50s, an energy dissipator that <clears throat> doesn't follow any of the, you know, the, the reclamation type. T it was a lot of judgment, you know, hits this uh, deflector, it goes down in here, and, and it goes through the, you know, the paddles, and, and then it goes out through a square, and it works, it's worked very nice for six years, uh, 60 years. Uh, this is flow during construction. It has a, a wood top to it, which they're redoing that deck. Uh, now, I did use high, heck grass uh, to try to develop the profiles and, 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 and keyed in uh, cross sections of this system to try to really arrive at <coughs> uh, the, the, the capacity and the headwater constraints to try to essentially line this with something pre and post that would, that would work. Uh, I, I used the broken back uh, feature in HY8 in reverse. I know this is really for energy dissipation use, but we, and you can kind of see what's developing here uh, with the up. Uh, we basically have, uh, you know, uh, 13 feet per second coming out of that reducer and over 20 feet per second, but outlet control in the upper portion. So. <clears throat> Uh, one of the big hydraulic questions in the beginning was what, whether or not it's the reducer with the inlet control or the, the outlet control of the upper pipe and, and the pipe friction that's the controlling element here. And uh, it, it, you, you do end up getting higher headwater with the inlet uh, control further in the pipe, but again, uh, just like I'm trying to follow the footsteps of where the Indians stop. Uh, here, I'm, I'm asking, uh, you know, why, why this type of inlet st structure uh, when it's outlet control, and specifically, what's really the purpose of of this rounded section here? I've, I've kind of concluded that, you know, back inside here, the top of the pipe, this this tapers down, and the the. The atmosphere is, is higher on, just inside this wall. I, I think this wall might have been just to keep people out of there, but I, but I did ask a lot of you know other others uh, if they. You know, I'd be interested if anybody has ever seen this type of structure where you have it it, it dipped down a rounded taper, and whether that does help for inlet control. But essentially, <coughs> I took the the normal coefficients and 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 uh, applied a percent improvement to that based on um, headwater calx. And the, uh, fortunately, this railroad is also owned by the, DO, the state of New Hampshire. So we, had, we were able to consult with our railroad engineers. They didn't like the fact that our 100-year was up over here and running down the side of the railroad w with some of our earlier estimates. <coughs> but. We haven't had a history of flooding here, and and the, the risk really isn't great to property. It's the risk is to the to the railroad and to the to the. Uh, so we moved ahead with <coughs> these, uh, essentially trying to match pre and post. And I we looked at uh, just about every type of liner technology out there on this project to developed cost estimates. Each one of these directories has HY8 analysis in it. And, and we arrived at, <clears throat> OK, ideally, we'd put a concrete box in. But again, the tourism inter interruption to the road uh, wasn't. It's, so we went with metal liners, al aluminum liners in the lower sections, which, um, again, a bigger pipe up and below now the two lower sections or smaller sections. We, we lined it with the next size down, and we, we, we've used a geopolymer mortar in this upper, uh, upper section. And this was, <coughs> we weren't, uh, based on some of the other studies and other applications we've seen around the country, we didn't think that the centrifugal application would work in, a, in an arch pipe, so we, um, the, the contractors had gone about this shooting uh, sh similar, similar to uh, Quick Creek and, 
and, and applying uh, with a trowel to get the thickness up and then a final cosmetic coat. We had uh, structural certifications based on the loads in the road. Uh, obviously the, the metal pipes were uh, flexible liner and, and now with the geopolymer we certainly have a rigid, a rigid liner. Uh, so we have the, the buckling strength uh, somewhere around 19,000 uh, PSI and uh, it, with an assumed thickness of about two and a quarter inches. I think we've achieved about two, two and three quarter inches in, in parts of this geopolymer. We also had to certify uh, uh, you know, for, for the, the metal liners, the, um, the grouting and yeah, this is, these are our, our bids. In, in New Hampshire, we go with low bid. Uh, that's, that's worked out well, in, 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 unless there's arguments that can be made for the, for the other bids. That, that's part of the review process. Uh, they all came in around 1, 1 1.8 million. And the bypass flow here, we had uh, four pipes running a six inch, eight inch, couple four inch pipes. Really the, the dewatering in the end was our, our major concern. Uh, you can see it was a relatively straightforward process to, to rig up these pumps and we did have a lot of rain this summer, the last couple months, so this did overtop a couple times. Uh, they prepared for it and uh, this is the end result. In uh, about a half a dozen spots where <clears throat> we do have the spalling. Uh, the, I just got an email this morning saying that the 28 day uh, sample cores have failed in buckling. Uh, we, we, we've gone back and forth with the manufacturer and this has been labeled as a um, cosmetic issue, uh, but we have I, this. I wasn't too happy to see this in the. This is overspray, from, you know, if if they had just hung up a plastic sheet here, uh, th this all this was smooth aluminum corrugations, until the sprayer came out and the overspray went down in there for about 30 feet. So that Manning's has changed. It can, this doesn't look too very pretty. Paper mache. It's it's. It's hardened up nice uh, after a, a few more, but essentially the dewatering part here didn't work because seepage from down below. And I think we'll, we'll be changing our spec to, to help contractors out, although this is also their responsibility to, to provide a, a, a uniform invert prior to beginning the application. Uh, we, uh, yeah. It, this is the first geopolymer that we've, we've done in New Hampshire, and we're doing another one in the next couple of weeks at a different location. Uh, filling in the corrugations has been the biggest debate in terms of materials, but this dewatering operation, uh, right on the bags it says don't, don't apply and even standing water. I think the, the contractors were uh, under the impression that <coughs> it was only uh, flowing water that, that mattered. Uh, yeah, we have the normal shrinkage cracks here that we'll be watching. So, uh, I wanted to <coughs> just extend, uh, out, uh, if anybody wants to contact me about more information, uh, we're um, going through our, our spec for liners, uh, 602 spec for all of our liner technologies. I have a red line document now, we'll be in the next month or so. Uh, making revisions based on what we're learning this year. And uh, yeah, who says the, the old man has crumbled, right? This is, this is right above the rock scaling. This, this is, I'm gonna call it the old, the, the gorilla in the mountain. That's up. <coughs> and uh, we, were, we were thinking maybe we maybe should paint the eyes and the nose. And, and then over, uh, over, over by where the old man in the mountain used to be, this, there is this. So it's, uh, it's not all lost. <clears throat> Are there any questions that anybody has? Um, this is kind of
kind of more of a structural question. So could you, could you assess the existing metal color to sort of give it a structural rating to add the concrete structural capacity to the act, or did you just assume that it's fully deteriorated? Yeah, it fully deteriorated, and, and I did have, I thought I had some slides in here about the condition of the existing color. It's something we've been monitoring for a number of years and in our bridge uh, operations folks actually went in, the, 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 the pipe itself has been failing from corrosion uh, along the spring line, and not so much the invert. There's not a lot, uh, and they've gone in and, and patched it with rebar and, uh, but I, I think, uh, so, so the geopolymer is supposed to take all of the load monolithically and and I was the, the only the only real way that we can uh, say that it, that structurally it's, it's failed is, is you know, through our existing existing spec is probably with the minimum thickness that we've, we've determined the upper end by hydraulics the lower end by structural uh, but the multi-layer chemical uh, bond to form the monolithic structure is, is key and and that, that uh, was also a, one of the certifications structurally was the chemical engineer uh, here. But so another aspect of that is verification of the thickness. So we use the bolts as a guide here, but I think what we would probably want to do in the future is develop some wire, uh, wire guides that, that would be, uh, you know, put right up at the, the end of the corrugation. So we always, we can measure that thickness at the end. We had, we do have a video spec. I'm very interested in talking to Minnesota DOT or Ohio about their, their unit for video. Our video in this case ended up being a, a contracted with a miner's light and a cell phone or some other camera walking through the pipe. So, yeah, that wasn't what we meant. We, we had, so there's a lot of truck traffic up through here, and that was our, and, and we were really particularly concerned about the, the, the trucks that were making the ascent, climbing up the hill from down below and having to stop them. Uh, and that, that was, uh, we, we had a good traffic control plan and we were able to keep the lane, lanes open because everything was underground. The only exception to that was the, the rocks scaling. And uh, it was rather dramatic, some of the chunks that came down and, and yeah. Uh, but uh, even though it was expensive, the traffic management here, it, it worked well and we didn't have disruption. Anybody else? Thank you again, I really enjoyed it.